and the balance that we needed with those three characters. Uh, so I worked on it for six months, and then the writer's strike happened in, in 08. I mean, yeah, <clears throat> 07, 08. And uh, I had already put off other projects that I had. Uh, and he'd worked with Dan on Capote. <clears throat> and um, so uh, I went off to do other things, and Dan came in. And um, it was great working with Dan. Um, not that I ever did, but uh, he was very... Uh, it was very, uh, <clears throat> you know, right in line with the work that I'd done and uh, the characters and the tone and the pacing and everything. So um, the script was put on the blacklist in 08, if you know what that is. The 100 best unproduced screenplays of a given year, it's called the blacklist. We found that out about Whiplash last week. Oh, okay. That was on the blacklist. <clears throat> well, there you go. So Damien was on there. Well, this was 08. And, um, At least you showed up on time. Yeah. Big deal, yeah. <laughs> I, I chastised him. I saw him the other night. <laughs> um, so, so I knew that Dan had, you know, had whatever he'd done, had, he hadn't ruined my genius. And, uh, um, so, so, um, but I never actually sat in a room with him. In fact, I didn't even meet him until last year. Uh, but we have been great collaborators on Q and A's. That's great. Now, uh, Channing, T I think Channing Tatum was amazing in the movie. Was he the first person attached to the film? Who, who, how did you get the cast together? Um, well, Channing Tatum is an interesting story. I was. It is the summer of '07, and I'm <clears throat> meeting Bennett. And he comes in one morning, he goes, I had lunch yesterday with this guy, I think he's really good, I think he's really powerful, and he's done MMA, and he's really athletic, and <clears throat> I said, oh, wow, okay, yeah. And he said, yeah, and his name's Channing Tatum. And I said, okay, never heard of him. <clears throat> um, and he'd only done one movie at that time. Um, but he kind of stuck to the, to, the, uh, to the project, and uh, financing fell out, and there was strike and there was a financial crisis and <clears throat> but he was always kind of there in the background and then um, Bennett went off to do Moneyball and then the time came <clears throat> and uh, kind of the stars, if you pardon the pun, aligned mm -hmm. and uh, Carell came on board and Mark Ruffalo and financing showed up and there Ooh, it was. You have a movie. And you have a movie. movie. Steve Carell was was not the most obvious choice for that part. I mean, we all think of Steve Carell as just doing comedy. So how did Steve Carell get attached to it? Um, oh, his nose was huge. Is that what Dupont's nose was like? Yes. <laughs> I mean, there must have been more cocaine going up that nose than I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, yeah. For for anybody that's interested, if you go on YouTube, there is a a, a documentary that he had. <clears throat> had commissioned, and you can see him uh, at Foxcatcher Farm in his sweatsuit and doing all kinds of stuff. But you can also look at the real Mark Schultz and the real Dave Schultz wrestle, and you will really appreciate what these actors have done as far as embodying those those guys and their athleticism. When you see Channing Tatum do a backflip, that's really Channing Tatum. Ch Channing doing the backflip, by the way. Um, uh, Mark Schultz was a, uh, a state high school gymnast uh, uh, champion yeah, in California before he became a wrestler, before he followed his brother into wrestling. So he was a phenomenal athlete, and I think those guys really captured their physical. Well, before shooting the film, how long did they have to work on learning how to wrestle? Uh, they worked about six months, yeah. Uh, although uh, Mark Ruffalo was a pretty good high school wrestler. So he, had a, he had a big jump on, on Chan. And what about the makeup? The makeup's amazing. And how long did that take every day? Uh, I think it took uh, about two and a half hours on on uh, <clears throat> on Steve Carell to do the nose and the hair and the rotten teeth and, the, and all the other stuff that he had going on there. Okay, um, well, I'll ask, if you have questions, I'm going to come out there in a minute, but I mean, it's obvious that DuPont was in love with the Channing Tatum character. I mean, is that what I'm supposed to draw, and did something happen, or and you didn't put it in the film, or do I just think what I think? Uh, well, there's a, I'll, I'll, make, I'll talk about two things. One is, when I was working on the script, uh, we had no corroboration that Mark had ever done cocaine. He'd never said to, to Bennett, nor I, uh, 
I did cocaine there. We heard anecdotal evidence from other wrestlers that there was cocaine around, but we didn't know. So when I wrote that helicopter scene, I didn't. It, there was no cocaine in it because Bennett didn't want to put it in there. That came later when Mark actually talked to, to Bennett and said, yeah, I, I was doing cocaine. Uh, the other thing that, that was never corroborated <clears throat> and really no even anecdotal evidence uh, was the homoerotic nature of that. I mean, wrestling is two guys wearing almost nothing rolling around on a mat. So you could look at that any way you want. Um, Bennett and I, uh, because there was no, nobody ever said, this is what happened. We chose not to put it in there. And <clears throat> so you can take away from it whatever you want. I think part of it is just the nature of, of wrestling. Um, but, but there was, to this day, I, I've never heard anybody say that anything happened with DuPont. Creepy, yes. Very creepy. Yeah. <laughs> very creepy. And, and Vanessa Redgrave, I mean, she's very, but she's one of the great actresses. But why would Vanessa Redgrave take such a, a little part? I mean, the movie Ooh. gal could have played that. I mean, that's <laughs> Oh, she did it for the money, obviously. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't know, you know, why, why does anybody do anything? Why did I write that? I, I, this is the downer of a movie in a way. Um, no, I think it's a really interesting part, and, and <clears throat> there was just just enough in there that I, that I think achieved what it was supposed to do, which part of what it was supposed to do was make the DuPont character accessible to people. Because uh, we can all identify, I think, with having parents who are dissatisfied with us or not giving us the respect that we, we want to have as kids. And um, so I think a little bit of Vanessa Redgrave went a, went a great distance. And that's why when she died, he lets the horses out. That's his hatred for the mother. To say, yeah. This is your most prized possessions. Goodbye. Yes. <clears throat> In fact, Bennett had told me that story in the course of hours and hours of conversation. He said, oh yeah, you know, and DuPont, she had these, I think, the story he told me that they, they were ponies of some sort, you know, groomed and manicured. And, and he said, yeah, when, when she died, that she, she um, uh, that he'd gone and opened the barn up and let them all out, and they became kind of feral. Uh, and he never trimmed them again, never did anything. I said, ah, that's a phenomenal moment. Yeah. Yeah. Where did you film this? Uh, it was filmed in western Pennsylvania. The, the DuPont estate had been sold about the time I was I was working on, I think oh six it was sold. So it was we went down there actually. That's about seven or eight hundred acres, and there was a chain link fence running all the way around. But by the side of <clears throat> about fifty yards off off this chain link fence, there was this driveway that led up to Dave Schultz's house, the house where he was killed. You could see it, and Dupont had ordered it painted black from prison. So it was it was sitting there. Uh, you know, peeling black paint on it. So why do you think he shot Dave Schultz? Um, <clears throat> you know, I, well, put it this way. Um, I think it was, you know, he had clearly had mental health issues. Um, and <clears throat> my experience with mental health issues, people that I know, and unfortunately I know a few, uh, is they always have their own internal logic and their own internal reason for doing anything. Uh, John DuPont never gave an interview or testified about why he did anything uh, or why he shot Dave Schultz. He never said. So that allowed us to <clears throat> uh, make up a reason why. And that, that's basically what the movie is, is the confluence of these three characters, these three personalities coming together, almost like a, um, a, a Greek tragedy, I guess, and, and the outcome is inevitable that it's going to be bad. <clears throat> See, I thought he shot him because Dave Schultz represented everything he was never going to have in life. He had all this money, but he, he couldn't have the all-American family. He couldn't have any of that. Right. Because that wasn't his lifestyle. Right. Well, that, I mean, that's, it's, all, it's all, you know, um, Mark, Mark, <clears throat> Schultz and John DuPont were actually kind of vying for Dave's affection and respect. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, everyone realized that they weren't going to get what they needed. All right? Mark was not going to get the respect of his brother 
right. nor DuPont. DuPont was not going to get the respect of Dave Schultz, which is what he wanted. Uh, and it, it snowballed into in that kind of tragic outcome. And how is Mark's life now? It says he's teaching wrestling in Portland. Was they, but has he seen the movie, and what, what does he think of it? Uh, does anybody follow Twitter or Facebook? <laughs> Facebook. Facebook. Uh, well, Mark went on a rant a couple, six weeks ago. Anybody follow that? No. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so, so Mark was involved in the making of the movie. <clears throat> and I spoke to him, and Dan Futterman spoke to him, and we had interviews with him, and uh, he was very generous with his time. Um, but he was, you know, he was one point of view about what happened, and we, we ended up needing to involve other points of view. So Mark was great for Mark, <clears throat> um, and, but we had, to, we had to figure out how, how the story went with other characters. Dave being not available, and, and John DuPont also. Um, so w there was a little bit of pushback, I guess, because Mark in real life is also, as you saw in the movie, a little bit uncomfortable in his own skin. There's a lot of anger now uh, because <clears throat> you know he's never been able to replace that emotional hole that Dave filled in his life and, and now it's going on 20 years um, so he he the movie I think was cathartic for a, a, some part of him but also um, just reminded him of what happened and how much it hurt uh, and then he was he was affected because some of the critics talked about the homoeroticism right. And he got upset about that, even though he'd seen the movie four times. <clears throat> and that's, that was the Facebook. So you're not taking him to the Oscars Sunday? Uh, we won't <clears throat> see him on the red carpet. You know, I, he could be there. I don't know if he's going to be there or not. Well, duck. And we have a question? <laughs> I, I, I'm repeating your question, which is, why Steve Carell? Oh, oh sorry, I didn't answer this. that. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I, I didn't have anything to do with that, uh, but I will say that I think that uh, that that character is could have been and is anyway, uh, in spite of Steve Carell's uh, 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 comedic abilities, uh, a very dark and just really not a pleasant human being, and I think. The casting of Steve Carell was meant to blunt a little bit of that because he is his his persona by nature is is a lot lighter than than would have been healthy for for that character as far as the movie goes. I, I think if you'd have cast a, I don't know Christopher Walken in that part, <laughs> you know, you, you'd, you'd walk out of it because you know, oh no, this is going to be bad. <laughs> So, uh, so I think I think to, to Bennett's credit and obviously to Steve Carell's credit, he, he brought a certain levity to it, if that's even possible, um, that allowed people uh, some accessibility. One of the things Bennett and I talked about is we didn't want to make the DuPont character uh, a monster because <clears throat> um, that would have been too easy to do. So, so part of the reason that Steve Carell was cast was, I think, to, to blunt that monster. Two questions about the writing process that I imagine would have been difficult, which is, when you're writing nonfiction, do you have to reel yourself in constantly from taking too much poetic license and, and writing around the facts that you know? And secondly, um, these characters, I would say, pretty obviously were less eloquent than you. And do you have to force yourself to write down to the way that they talk versus how you talk? Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I think that's a compliment, right? Yeah. Um, the, the first thing I'll, I'll address is the, is the writing. When you're, when you're working with, with uh, a factual story, in some ways it's liberating because you have signposts that you are trying to get to and you know that, okay, once I get there, this is what really happened, so I'm, I'm, I'm good for a little bit. Um, but even if you're writing real, about real people and the lives of real people, 
you have to you have to be able to to really take their essence and then conform that to a movie character. And, the, and movie characters are not real people, um, although some people think they are. <clears throat> um, so we were very conscious of, of that, of, of uh, being respectful to, to especially Mark Schultz, um, but taking the license that was required to make him a movie character. Um, as far as the, the second question, what was it again? Yeah, you have, you have to sort of dumb down the oh, language. Dumb down. Uh, no, in fact, you know, <clears throat> I think what was remarkable, uh, remarkable about this is I went back <clears throat> after my, my wife saw the movie. Uh, she said to me, um, well, so what did you write? And uh, <laughs> I said, you know, I can't remember, honestly. She said, did you write that hotel room scene? I said, um, you know, I think I wrote a hotel room scene. So, so she said, well, can I read the script? So I, I went and, 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 uh, and let her read my draft. And she, you know, was sitting there and she go, oh, yeah, that there, that's there, this there. And then I took a look at a few pages because I, I don't like to look back on, on anything, especially that was a pretty pretty difficult script. And what I was surprised to find was how actually eloquent I had had made Mark and verbose I had made Mark. Um, <coughs> I think D Dan's uh, one of his big contributions was to actually start to to cut away some of that dialogue that was just too much. And then when the actors got a hold of it, and then when Bennett in post-production, um, you have the embodiment, uh, embodiments and the, the physical manifestation of those characters. You don't need you don't need that that all that dialogue. Um, so it was surprising to see the movie and, and realize, my God, they don't say anything for <laughs> for so long. Um, and I, where'd all that dialogue go? No, I didn't even remember that I hadn't that I hadn't done that. And it would only when I went back and looked at a few pages, I realized that I'd overwritten Mark. Okay, we have a question. Are there any descendants of the DuPont family that would be around now, or? Oh, there's a bunch of them. Uh, did, yeah, did you feel uh, okay writing about someone that, where the descendants are still living? And, not a very pretty picture. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, yeah, there's a lot of du there's a lot of Duponts um, still around, and um, I, I mean, what we wrote was in the public domain. Actually, we we didn't have to get life rights to to John Dupont because I'm sure that the family wouldn't have given them uh, what what we used was all kind of common knowledge. For example, buying the armored personnel carrier. You know, um, that that was there was some article about him doing that. So, you know, once it's in the public domain, it's it's fair game. I also this is my own personal uh, thought. I have never had this corroborated, but I think the Dupont family realized that the movie was going to happen, and they just backed off because. What are they going to do? I mean, that's what happened. Was that? They could have bought the studio. <laughs> they bought the studio. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I think they kind of just let it go and said, you know what, Black Sheep, not a real Dupont. I don't know what they said, but they, they, we never, you know, we're never sued. Also, don't call more, more attention to it. Yeah. You know, keep oh, it goes away. Yeah. Uh, two questions. One about um, Mark Schultz today. Is he as introverted now as he appeared to be then in the film? <clears throat> um, you know, he can be very outgoing and very uh, verbose, depending on the situation. Um, he's got kind of a shy streak in him, but if you sit down and engage him one-on-one, -on -one, he can, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's uh, listen, he's a, he's a gold medal wrestler. Uh, and, you know, you... You're not a dumb lug when you get to be when you reach that level of of, uh, of competition. Huh. And, this, and the second one is about uh, David's wife. 
did either one of you, you or Bennett, um, any time during this process have any interactions with her to see her perspective All the on, time. on DuPont? All the time. She and was very helpful. Uh, what gave, did she offer? Uh, gave us access to uh, a lot of uh, Dave's personal items. Um, in fact, the glasses that uh, Mark Ruffalo wears, those are really Dave's glasses uh, that she gave Mark to wear. Um, Is that in her perspective on DuPont? And she did have some interactions with him, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we, we, she did hours of interviews, very, very accessible. Uh, and any, anything that we wanted as far as the story or the script or uh, her, you know, memories of a certain event or time or place, she was more than happy. Uh, to, she's been very supportive of the film. I personally, I think that would be hard, but she has been. I guess I meant on the mental state. You know, any, any triggers or anything she noticed along the way that Oh, about DuPont? Yeah. Oh, just DuPont. the, yeah. Did, 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 the question is, did, did Nancy Schultz notice anything about John DuPont that would might have tipped her off what was going to happen? Or that he was just... Well, listen, he was very eccentric. Um, but he was a DuPont and he had a lot of money. And he was paying for their house and their lifestyle. and So uh, I, that caught everybody off guard. Yes. One, uh, I have to say, you nailed just about every point of it. I knew DuPont's uh, still photographer, and uh, he had told me an, an awful lot about the Du, you know, John DuPont, and his cocaine use was like he was snorting up Texas, <laughs> and the likelihood is that you know, the paranoia. He said he was highly paranoid, and uh, along with being probably half inbred anyhow, and. Uh, you know, it was, but you guys really did nail all the points that this fella had told me about. And he was a big, you know, gun collector and and all of that and just got weirded out and just let the guy have it. So, you know, you did a great job on covering all the aspects of it. I, I hope the, the wife ended up with a big settlement. Uh, well, she did, unfortunately. I mean, it, too bad, but yes, she did. And the kids did, too. Um, uh, listen, there was there was lots of stuff that we left out. One of my favorite things that I wrote that didn't make it into the movie was that Dupont, <clears throat> who did in fact call himself Eagle, um, had a bed made with sticks in the form of a nest, a big round mattress <laughs> um, that he that he kept in an office, kind of off the wrestling room. Um, so many so chemicals in that family. <laughs> I mean, it's a chemical family. Chemical family, yeah. There were several scenes in the movie <clears throat> that uh, showed John DuPont fixating on the machine gun. The first, of course, was the delivery of the carrier that didn't have the machine gun. And, this, and the second was the machine gun and the ammunition delivered to his office. And then, quite closely connected to that, was the scene we released the horses and of course my head said he was going to shoot the horses did he shoot the horses with the machine gun <laughs> no, second question uh, no um, uh, but but he did that was uh, that was a, a turning point I mean which we made in the film uh, I remember uh, Bennett telling me that that uh, uh, DuPont's mom had these ponies that were some I don't know rare breed and they she d doted on them unlike her son and they were groomed and manicured and they kept in this barn and <clears throat> and when she died that he went out and released the horses and they basically became feral in the pasture he never took them back in never combed them never brushed them and that was and fr so in in writing the the script and the story we use that as a moment of of he's been DuPont himself has been released to, to, to go to the extreme that he did. Uh, but he didn't actually shoot the horses. Okay, my, my second question is straight curiosity. Th this is a blockbuster story, and somehow I missed it. And I wondered if, if the trial and the, the actual shooting and the murder and his conviction was kind of kept under wraps because of who the DuPont family was. I, I would uh, I would say that might have some merit. <clears throat> yeah, um, I remember reading this was January of '96 when when Dave was was shot, um, and 
Yeah, there was a trial, and I don't know, it kind of went off the radar. Um, I, I don't know, how many people have actually had heard of this story before? I see a lot of them. And how many people knew the outcome of it? A couple. Did you, did you know that DuPont was going to shoot Dave, I guess is my question. How many people knew that? I'll only see only a few. Um, yeah. Um, so it, it, it should have been a big a bigger deal, I guess, than, than it turned out to be. So. I think nowadays it would be. I mean, it would have been all over television. Right. It would have been TMZ. Would have had, yeah. 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 Harvey Levin would have been living in the house. Uh, are you happy with the finished product? Um, Is that the movie that you envisioned when you wrote the script with Dan? Um, yeah, I mean, listen. When you're, you're writing a script, it's a two-dimensional thing. And it's in your head, but it's, it's really a, on a piece of paper. When you can get Channing Tatum and Steve Carell and Mark Ruffalo and Vanessa Redgrave and Jenna Miller to do a movie and become those characters that you wrote, it's, it's hard to be disappointed in. And what's next for you, Emax Fry? What's next? What are you working what's, on? Oh, God. I hate that question. I know. Um, <laughs> That's why I saved it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, writers in, in Hollywood always have multiple things going on. So I have a, a TV show and, and uh, a movie and, and I don't know, three or four movies. I just finished a script today, actually, another one. Um, Very cool. Yeah. So. And is it enough to be nominated? Because that to me is all BS. Don't you want to win Sunday? Uh, <laughs> yes, but I already, I, think, I already know that Grand Budapest Hotel is going to win, so um, I'm fine with that. Um, Would you like to be surprised Sunday? <laughs> no, I, it's, you know what? Um, of course, it's, it's really it's amazing, and it, i got to say it's crazy. It's crazy how serious they take the Academy Awards. <laughs> I went to the nominee lunch in a few weeks ago, and it's like they had, you know, guards with guns at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. Um, I mean, it, it's really, it's really nuts. To me, the biggest thrill, and I hate to say this, uh, who here is an Academy member? Good. Um, and they all voted. That's they the all voted. Um, we vote with our money. Um, Getting a WGA nomination to me was like wow, because those are writers, right. and 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 the Academy nomination is also the writers branch nominates you. the The Academy Award is voted on by everybody, actors, producers. <laughs> what do they know? Um, but but to be nominated by your peers is uh, pretty sure. pretty great. Pretty good. Last question. I just want hi. Microphone to you. I just wanted to. Um, have you uh, tell everyone at the nominee lunch what they, how, how much time they told you you could, if you got your to the award, how long you could have your speech for? Because I think that's really interesting. Yeah, they they give you that heads up at the nominees lunch, <laughs> um, forty five seconds and before the hook comes out. Um, Not enough time. Well, listen, I, for, for writers, it would probably be 15 seconds, but um, <laughs> if, you're, uh, if you're Rosamund Pike, I'm sure they'd let you go over a little bit. And if you're in a group, only one can talk. Oh, yeah. If you're, if you're a group of, uh, I think there's three writing credits on Birdman, for example. So if they win, they gotta, they got to designate who's going who's gonna to talk. Okay. Well, Emacs, I want to thank you. This was a terrific movie. Thank you for coming out tonight. And, uh, Best of luck Sunday. I think Sunday, I'm hoping it's a surprise all over the place. Because uh, I'm bored of all the same people winning. Yeah, no, it'll, it'll be different. Best of luck. Thank you.